Y'all ready? You ready for the word of God? Say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're here. I thought they were asleep. I wasn't sure. Adrian. First Corinthians. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God have chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Get this, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God ain't allowing no glory stealers. Huh? Look at Judges chapter 15. This is where we're going to take our text today. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. They shouted against him. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burned with fire and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and he took it and he slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass have I slain a thousand men. Drop back to verse 15. That's going to get my thought from today. And he found or he saw a jawbone of an ass and he put forth his hand. There's where the Holy Spirit enlightened me. He put forth his hand and he took it and slew a thousand men. And I want to use a simple subject for this morning. Get a grip on it. Get, get a grip on it. I don't, I don't know what your it is that God has given you to be successful, but God told me to tell you to get a firm grip on it. So we look at somebody and just tap them on the shoulder if you're not comfortable shaking their hand and say, my sister, my brother, get a grip. Get a grip on it. Father, bless your word today. Give me the kind of anointing that allows preaching to be easy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Beloved, each of us was inherently born with something to contribute to the world. There's not one person on this planet that, allowed, that God allowed to be birthed who did not come with something that they can uniquely give to the world and use to contribute to their society. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 tells Christians that all of you that are filled with the Spirit, each of you has been given a gift, has been given something that you could profit thereby. That there's no Christian in this room, no person, no child, no woman, no man in this room, that God has given you zero to work with. He has given each of you something, something that he has divinely put down inside of you so that as you come, you contribute something to the kingdom. God didn't leave anybody without a gift, a talent, an ability to increase the kingdom. Somebody say increase. Now, listen, some people never recognize their gift, so they don't cultivate it or they don't develop it. Right. We all have it. God has divinely implanted it, but we don't all recognize it, one, and then we don't develop it. We don't cultivate it. That's, that's why school is important. You may be a very smart individual, but getting around training, getting around good teaching, going to higher education, all those things are there to help you develop what God has already divinely implanted. Somebody say amen. So, so because some people don't take the time, the effort, the energy to develop what God has given to them, they never reach their full potential in life. In fact, you're playing yourself short. Think about this. Even as an employee, do you realize that you are paid because somebody recognizes your gift and your talent and they compensate you accordingly? 
So while you're sitting here saying, I don't have anything, I'm not worth anything, I have nothing to contribute, somebody right now is paying you for something that you bring to the table. Your ability to type, to organize, to build, to play something, an instrument, to solve problems, that people are willing to pay you money for your gift. So stop letting the devil play you. Stop letting him play you short. Stop, making, stop letting them play with your mind and make you feel like you don't have anything to offer because you do. You just may need to uncover it. You may need to discover it. And the person that's willing to pay you is a confirmation that you do have something. They pay you to build block. They pay you to type. They pay you to think, to organize. They pay you to do whatever it is that you get paid to do. It is a sign, it's a confirmation. And if you don't know the value of what you have, you don't even know what to ask for. That's why some people, when you go to an interview and you ask, they ask you how much you want to be paid, you're not sure what to ask for, so you say anything. Because you don't know the value of what you have. And when you don't know the value of what you have, you get played. When you don't know the worth, the value of what God has put in you and trusted in you, it leaves you open for people to play you. Whether it's somebody employing you or dating you, if you don't know your worth, my sister, it leaves you open to be played. I'm not going to mess with that. I'm not going to mess with that. I ain't get no amens on that. Some people, some people, now that's, that's another group of people. Some people do recognize their gifts but you're stuck on the fact that your gift is inadequate. You do recognize that you have something, but you're stuck on its insufficiency, how inadequate it is. And so you, you are, are destined to make the mistake that the, that the, the gentleman had who had the talents. One was given top 10, was one was given five, one was given one. He took his talent and he hid it. He put it in a place where it couldn't be used at all. Because they keep comparing it to other people. I'm going to say this to you. Comparison is the thief of joy. I'm going to say it again. Comparison is the thief of joy. Whenever you compare what you have to what other people have, sometimes it can steal your joy. Because sure, there's always somebody who has less than you. But we're focused on people who have more than us. And so compared to them, we feel like we don't have anything. And so we put it on the shelf. And here's what God called the one who hid his talent. You are a wicked servant. Ain't that strong? I would have gone back to God and said, well, if you gave me more, I would have done more. But God said, even what you have, if I give you something, I gave you all you need. Oh, God. Oh, God. So they hit it. But sit, let, let, me, let me slow down and say this. The truth is, in life, you don't always get the best tools to work with. Come on, somebody. We're not all born with silver spoons in our mouths. In fact, most of us aren't. We aren't always raised in the perfect environment. You may not be raised in a perfect house. That none of us get the best tools. Then all of us can look around and say, I wish I had more or I wish I was raised in a better environment. So the black people saying, I wish I was raised with the advantages of being white. Or somebody who was raised with a single parent says, I wish I had the blessing of having both parents. Or somebody who has both parents wish I didn't have the parents that I have because they're crazy. <laughs> We all got some. We all can point to something and say, I wish I had more of this or more of that. None of us were raised in perfect environment. Most of us are raised with inadequacies, insufficiencies. But here's what God does. Whatever you didn't get, God makes up the difference. Come on, somebody. You may come up as a five, but you need ten. But that difference in there, God always makes up the difference. He doesn't leave you worried and frustrated and confused and say, if I had and I wish I had. God steps in and makes up the difference. He fills up the gap between, get this, your weakness and his sufficiency. Come on, talk to me, somebody. It is God who makes up that difference. So away with all of you who want to excuse yourself from the service of the Lord, complaining, I wish I had, I wish I was born in a better environment. I wish I had more tools. God gave you exactly what he wanted you to have to do what he needs you to do. And where you find yourself falling short, God makes up the difference. Somebody give God praise for making up the difference. 
That's why I don't have to envy you. Even though I was raised with a single parent, I don't have to raise you with two parents. I don't have to be envious of you who had two parents because God made up the difference. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Yeah, I don't have to envy you because you were raised in a better part of town and I was raised on the poor side of the tracks because God makes up the difference. Talk to me, somebody. You single parents ought to be shouting me down right now because some of you say, Lord, if I just had a husband, if I just had help, if I just had support, but having you realize that God's been blessing you anyway? He gave you a house anyway. He gave you a car anyway. You started a business anyway. How dare you disrespect God talking about what you need? I need a husband. God said, I've been better to you than any husband you could ever have. Good God Almighty. And until you appreciate the husband I am, you won't get the husband you want. Come on, somebody. Oh, y'all ain't going to give me no amens today. That's all right. I'm coming down your street. So in our text, Samson is an example of an ordinary man who accomplishes extraordinary things if God is with him. There are certain things that God would accomplish in your life that people will say, no man could do these things. Say, if God be with you. God knows how to set up situations that require him. He comes in and says, this is a job for Superman. <laughs> God takes his super and puts it on your natural and allows you to do supernatural things, extraordinary things that, that you know you couldn't do this by yourself. And the Bible, listen to this, the Bible never describes Samson's physical attributes. You know your Bible. You all know that Samson was the strongest man that ever lived. If you know, if you went to Sunday school, you heard about Samson. And in all the great things we hear about him doing, the Bible never describes his physical attributes. What it describes is what he does when the Spirit of God will come upon him. And many of you right now, you are saying to yourself, you know, I, I look at my body, I look at my account, I look at my education, and I could do more if I just had. But God said, I'm not looking at your physical appearance. I'm not looking at what you have in your coffer. I'm not looking at your outward. See, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And when I get ready to use you, I don't want anybody talking about how physical you look, how great you look, how shapely you are, how broad your shoulders are how tall or how sexy you are. I want them to look at you and say, this person is blessed because God is on them. Is there anybody in here that can testify that I'm successful because God is on me? Come on, somebody. We're so focused on people's outward. Is he tall? Is he short? Is he thin? Is he fat? Is he cute? Is he ugly? And all those things are outward things that, are, that, are, that we address. But God just needs somebody who say, Lord, just use me to your glory. Is there anybody in here who feels like God just use me? Use me with my crazy self. Use me with my short self. Use me with my bald self. Use me with my fat self. Use me with my, use me with my skinny self. Whatever it is I have, God, you can use it to your glory. If that's you, would you give God 30 seconds of praise right here? The Bible never focuses on the things we focus on. We focus on the outward. God focuses on the inward. But notice the timing of the anointing that would come on his life. In this particular verse, the timing of it was when the enemy shouted. When the enemy shouted against him, that's when the anointing came upon him. In other words, it was the attack that activates the gift. Somebody heard me. See, people think that the anointing comes to make you feel good. See, and some people come to church because they want to feel good. And we get in God's presence and we want the anointing to flow and we want the, the, the choir to sing and the preacher to preach so that we can feel good. You think that the anointing comes upon you so that you can have the power to dance and sweat out your clothes and have a good time. But in reality, we do all that, praise the Lord. But in reality, the anointing comes to empower you. It comes to make you capable. It comes to make you able if you come into a service like this and the anointing of God falls on you mightily like this and all you got out of church was a good feeling, but you don't take that same power back to your job and to your family and to your community, then it was a waste of the anointing. 
What, at times, what God does, because he knows how we are, right? sometimes we allow, he allows circumstances to arise that make you spring into action. Can, can I say this without offending anybody? Sometimes we, we, we waste the anointing. We, can I be honest? We waste the anointing. We, we don't use it for what it was given to us for. And you wonder why your life is not fulfilled. Because, And I say this, and I hope you don't take this wrong, but there has to be more than church than just jumping and shouting. Come on, somebody. There has to be more to the life of God than just breaking my heel and sweating out my suits. That, that We do all that, and I praise God for that. And so when we are bound with issues and bound with circumstances, we will raise up a praise like we did a few minutes ago. That was an opportunity for you to pull down God's power, pull down God's presence, pull down God's anointing into your life. You should never waste an opportunity to participate in a worship service because you don't know what kind of devils you're going to have to face this week. So all of you that come to church and just stare at what's happening on the stage and just hope, look at your watch and say, Lord, when will this be over? You are missing the opportunity. Stopping by church is like stopping by the gas station when your car's on E. You don't stop at the gas station because it's fun. You stop by because you need gas because you need to get somewhere. How many folks are going somewhere and you came by today to get a fill up? The anointing came when the problem came. And God sometimes will allow circumstances to arise to push you into action, to push you, to push what's down in you to come out of you. So here's how it works. You prayed for wisdom and God gave you problems. Watch me here. You pray for power. God, give me power. Give me power. And God gave you enemies. (laughs) <laughs> you you pray for strength. I just want strength, God. And God gave you, look, he gave you challenges. Why? Because I'm trying to activate something in you. You don't need an anointing to go to the beach. Who needs an anointing to sit on the beach with your toes in the sand and the sun on your face? I don't need an anointing for that. You don't need an anointing to sit in your easy chair and click the remote. I don't need an anointing for that. I need an anointing when I've got an enemy shouting against me. I need an anointing when I'm dealing with a difficult boss. And I want to go off. And everything in me wants to... I need an anointing to be able to respond to them in Christian character. Y'all not going to talk to me. I need an anointing to deal with challenging coworkers. I need an anointing when you're dealing with difficult kids. Y'all ain't got no difficult kids. Y'all got cute, little, nice, respectful, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, kids. But, but I'm talking about those who occasionally have a kid that make you want to just slap the name out the phone book. This disrespectful. After all I did for you, after all the things I did for you, after all the sacrifices I made, and you dare stand up in my face and act like you don't I <laughs> That, that's just me. That's just me. I know you talked about our kids. I had five of them, so I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how many can testify them kids that make you, that they'll make you come outside yourself? You know, good old deacon, good old mother, good old church praying mother and everything, and them kids will make you come outside yourself, and they'll be looking at you like, Mama and lost her mind. Yeah. <laughs> you always got that kid who want to test your gangster. Deacon, <laughs> Deacon Brown, they forget that you, you, you came from the street. They, you came from the hood. You, you, you know, you, you, you polished up now, but they forgot that you was that dude, right? Yeah, you don't play. You, you forgot I was that dude, and you always going to test my gangster. See, I wore my preacher robe and my collar, and I walk in being dignified and praise the Lord, but somebody always want to push your buttons and make you for. <laughs> And remind you that you was that dude. You was that chick. You know that girl. You know that girl that'll cuss you three times from Sunday. Just jump on you like a wolverine. Drag you in the street like you done lost your mind. Whoop you three days from Sunday. And when people see you respond in a Christian way, they don't know that's the anointing. Come on, that's the anointing. If, If you cuss me out and you see me respond with, I'm praying for you, that's the anointing. 
if this child raise up in my face and I don't knock you through that window, that's the anointing. If my boss say something stupid and I don't spin around in this chair and throw this computer at you, that's the anointing. Oh, yo, I know. I ain't got no real Christians in here. I ain't got no real. Where my real Christians at that? No. Look at somebody and say, that's the anointing. That, that's the anointing. I know you said something smart, and I didn't say nothing back because I'm too anointed to respond to you. That was the anointing that made me say, God bless you. You should have heard what was going through my mind. You should have heard what, oh, my God. It was about 20 things that went through my mind. I was ready to switchblade you, but I came out with, praise the Lord. God bless you. I'm praying for you, but you should have heard what was in my head. See, see, so the anointing helped me to respond. <laughs> that's 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 what I need the anointing when I'm dealing with the the, the, the the vicissitudes of life the challenges of life the sicknesses I don't need an anointing to be able to dance I was dancing in the street come on somebody where the church folks at here let me take my glasses off where the church I didn't need an anointing to dance how many of y'all were dancing when you wasn't saved come on <laughs> See, I'm always telling too much. Let me get on back to the scriptures here. Tell someone, I say, activate. activate. The church is suffering because real Christians don't activate. We don't activate the anointing. We call it a hot service when we've all jumped around and thrown chairs and fell out. But I call it anointed service when you walk out with vision, strategy. I call it anointed service while I'm preaching. You're writing down something that God is telling you that you need to do. That's when I call it a good service. Oh, pastor, they shouted. It was a good service. Not necessarily. Because I've seen people shout all over the church and still be broke, still be divorced, still can't get their life together, still have no peace, still have no joys. And so I need power to deal with my life. Touch somebody and say, Activate. So look at the timing of this anointing. This is what happened with Samson. God anointed his eyes, here it is, Mark Brown, to see possibilities. When we come to church, it's an opportunity for God to open our eyes to something that we haven't seen before. Stop putting pressure on our preachers to entertain you. We're not here to entertain you. We're here to empower you. Think about somebody going to college in a college classroom. I don't go and sit in the professor's room, sit in his classroom for you to impress me or to entertain me. I come for you to educate me, to empower me, to put something in my head. So why is it that we go to institutions of learning to get information, but we come to church and get entertainment? When this is the place that God has given to give you vision. While I'm talking, your eyes should be enlightened. Some should go, aha, in your mind. Some should go, yeah, I get that. Because if I've done that, I have done my job correctly. So here was Samson in a situation where the enemy shouted against him. And look what happened to him. God, God anointed his eyes to see possibility. Let me say this, love of God. What we lack often in church is not resource, but we lack vision. We lack vision for what's possible. We lack creativity, ingenuity. Listen, I appreciate modern conveniences. I do. I appreciate all the Facebook and Instagram and, and, and all these fancy. I was, I was talking to somebody the other day, and we were talking about the fact that we don't remember phone numbers anymore. How many remember phone numbers anymore? I don't. If I want to call somebody, I just hit the button <laughs> in my phone. I don't even notice. I hit the name, as a matter of fact. Mark Brown, call him. I don't even know his phone number, but I'll call him in a minute. Right. We were also talking about how she was she was fussing at me, honey, because she said, uh, the pastor, do you know where so and so? -and -so? I said, no, where is that? And I said, well, I don't I don't know the street. She said, you don't know the street. I said, no, I just put it in my GPS. I don't know the street. I don't know which way to turn. The GPS turns me and tells me where to go. I put the address in and I follow the map and I get there. Right. So I appreciate modern conveniences. It's really great. But can I be honest? I think that modern conveniences has somewhat spoiled us. Made us a little lazy. We have the latest tools of engineering and technology at our disposal, and yet there were previous generations who had none of that, and they built great things. Think about it. The great pyramids of Egypt, 
are a modern wonder. They are thousands of years old. There are architects and scientists and engineers today who are still trying to figure out how they did that thousands of years ago. When you look at your Bible, it talks about how they built Solomon's temple was the grandest uh, uh, edifice at his time. And the Bible talks about how they would go and they would cut the blocks in one place and then they would bring it to the place and put it in in one place and it would fit perfectly into the wall. Perfectly. It was so perfect that they couldn't even put a knife in between the bricks. How'd they do that? Let me make something more recent. When you think about uh, African-American communities, right? Think about the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Those African-Americans were just a few years from slavery, just got out, just fresh out of slavery. And yet they built communities where they had bankers and lawyers and doctors. They built a community that was so impressive that people all around the country were looking at them. It's called Black Wall Street. And they did this under Jim Crow laws. They did this with prejudice. They did this with open outward prejudice. They did it with all these kind of pressures. They have built communities that even we can't do today with all of the adventures that we had. What am I saying? I'm saying if our fathers were able to do great things without with doing with less than what we have, it is an indictment against us. Y'all not listening to me this morning. Our fathers took less. And they did more, Mark Brown, because they worked with what they had. Do you hear me? They worked with what they have. They got creative. They took what was at their disposal and they grabbed it and they used it to the best of their ability. Oh, my God. While you complain with your fancy computers and your laptops and all your modern technology, while you complain about what you can't do, think about what our mothers did. They didn't always have the fancy equipment that they had. How many of you mothers know have mothers that would take what, what little bit you had in the kitchen? <laughs> I know these, these modern sisters don't know nothing about that. The, my, our mothers and our grandmas, they would go in the kitchen with little or nothing and come out with a whole Thanksgiving meal. <laughs> You talking about I gotta have all this and all that? No, no, they would go there be a little bit of macaroni, huh? And a little bit of hamburger, and a sliver of cheese, and come out with something that say it's dinner time. <laughs> Cause they knew. Come on, y'all talk to me. Cause they knew how to take what they had and work with it. Look at somebody say you gotta learn how to work with what you got. Samson looked around when the enemy jumped out the bushes. He looked around and saw a jawbone and thought, oh, my God, help. Help. <laughs> he grabbed the jawbone and shouted, help. What is this? Not a sword, not a javelin, not a shield, a jawbone of all things. He grabbed something that other people didn't see. Here it is, the potential in, and he worked with it. Oh, God, I feel like I'm dropping bombs on somebody. Is it possible that God has already put in your life the things that you need to bring deliverance, but you're just overlooking it? That somewhere in your cupboard that there is what you need. That somewhere around your life, God has already placed what you need within your grasp. But you're just looking over it because you're complaining about what you don't have and what you wish you had. And I need God to anoint my eyes to see what I have and take what I have and say, ha, help. Ah, somebody touch your eyes and say, Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes. Maybe what I need is right around me right now. You can't see it because your eyes are not anointed. I need God let me see what's, what's here. What's in this cupboard, widow woman, that I can pour out and bless my family? What's in my coffers? What am I overlooking? I know, God, that you are doing great things, and I know you will do great things, but sometimes God has already done it. You just don't realize it. God, who am I talking in here? Shout at your boy. He grabbed a jawbone, jumped up, said, ah, I got help. Now, <laughs> grabbed a jawbone. He got a grip on it. Here's what God told me to tell somebody in here. He said to tell you, if you get a grip on it, God will get in it. I don't know who that's for. I don't know who I'm speaking to. But God said, I've already put it at your disposal. 
I've already put it right. You ain't even got to go get it. I've already put it right where you can reach it. You just don't see it. But if you open your eyes and get a grip on it, I'll get in it. Yeah, you keep saying, God, send help. And God said, I've already sent help. You're just not utilizing the help I've sent. God, who am I talking to today? It's already at your disposal. Look at somebody and say, it's already here. It's already there. It's a, the answer to your problem is already there. The persons that you need to advance your, degree, your ministry is already here. The person that you need to take it further, Mark Brown, it's already close to you. You keep looking out there, and God said, look in here. That's why some of you, you you're, you're looking for somebody to help you. And perhaps you are the help that you've been praying for. Is it possible that while you're saying God send us help, is it possible that you are the help that God sent to us? That you are the answer to the problem. So while you're praying for the problem, God said you are the answer. Maybe that's what's wrong with us right now. We have this welfare mentality where we want somebody to always come help us, deliver us, bring us out. But God said, I've already put down in you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't see it because to you, it's inadequate. It's not enough. It's not good. It's not sharp. But God said, if you grab it, if you put your hands on it right now, if you grip it, God said, I'll get in it. I hope y'all taking notes. My God, I couldn't wait to tell y'all this word this morning. So listen, write this down. Number one, the weapon that God has given to you is going to be an unusual one. It's going to be an unusual one. I'm trying to help you. Because I heard somebody push back and say, ain't got nothing. You're wrong, pastor. You missed it on, you missed God on that one. But God said to tell you, it's going to be an unusual weapon. Who would have ever thought to weaponize a jawbone? Who would have ever thought? God didn't give him a sword. God didn't give him a shield. See, normally when you go to war, you want to fight fire with fire. So at least God could have given the man a sword to give him a fighting chance. I mean, he was still outnumbered a thousand men to one. But at least if he had had a sword in his hand, he might have had a fighting chance. But he gave him a jawbone. And nobody had ever done that before. See, see, Judges was written before uh, they started writing about David. So if he, had the, if he had the benefit of reading about David and how David took a slingshot in a rock and killed a giant, then he would have had something to go by. But this was before David. So he didn't have anybody to go by. It was unprecedented. Some of the things that God was doing in your life, you're going to be frustrated because there's nobody who's done it like that before. So what God is asking you to do defies conventional wisdom. If you talk to other people who are trying to do what you're trying to do, they will tell you right now that doesn't work. They'll discourage your dream. They'll shut down your ideas because you're trying to compare what God has told you to do to what they did. And they're going to tell you right now it doesn't work. It was unprecedented. When you're, but you know what? When you get in a real fight, when you get in a real fight, Daphne, and all you can grab is a jawbone, you just got to do what you got to do. <laughs> I mean, know what I'm talking about. It ain't gonna make no sense. It ain't gonna be. It's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be weak. It's unusual. And I hear God saying, "I'm gonna do some unusual things in your life." You keep trying to be cookie cutter and do it like everybody else did it. And the reason why it doesn't work for you is because that's what I did for them. But I'm gonna do something different for you because you you are unique. I've equipped you. I've designed you. I crafted you in a certain way to accomplish certain things, to reach certain people, and you're going to have to start being yourself. God, look at somebody say, be yourself. Be yourself. Listen, listen, and I know they're going to laugh at it because they'll say, that's stupid. Anybody ever had a dream and you came out with this crazy idea that God gave you for something to do, and the first thing somebody want to do is throw water on your dream and say, that's stupid. They say that doesn't make sense. That doesn't work economically. It doesn't work practically. They will discourage you because they say that doesn't work. But sometimes God will take things that look foolish. That's what happened with Samson. He took something that looked foolish and got the victory. First Corinthians says this, that God has chosen the foolish things, the weak things, the base things, the things that are not 
to bring to nothing the things that are. God is taking stuff that everybody else says is trash. Everybody else says is stupid. Everybody else says it's weak. God uses those things. In fact, Corinthians says he chose those things. Choice, choice, choice. Choice implies options. When you have a choice, that means you have options. I could have chosen this, but I chose this. So God is saying, I could have chosen somebody more qualified, but I chose you. See, I, 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 I could have chosen somebody who was smarter. I could have chosen somebody who came from a better background. I could have chosen somebody who was cuter. I could have chosen somebody who could sing better, who had more voice, who had more talent. But I stepped over them and I chose you. Are there any chosen people in here? Are there any people that in here that can really admit that God could have gotten somebody better, but he chose you? Maybe I'll talk to these people over here. Is there anybody over here who can admit God could have gotten somebody else, but he chose me, and he did it so that nobody could get glory? See, as long as you think you got everything you need, God don't get no glory out of it. But God waits till he knows that you don't have anything so that when he does it, he gets all the glory. In fact, I, I, would, I would dare to say to in this room, that maybe right now, if you're going to be honest, you shouldn't even have what you have. You, you shouldn't even be living as well as you're living. You shouldn't even be driving what you drive. When, uh, see, we, see, we look at you now. You're all polished and cute and everything and look all grand. But how many can be honest and say, based on my back, let me talk about me. Based on my background, my education, my family tree, my family structure, there's no way I should be living the way I live or have what I have or drive what I drive. Is there anybody else that feels like that? But God blessed you anyway. If people saw what you came from, my God, that's why you got to testify. Because if people saw where you came from, they wouldn't believe. See, see, see here's the problem. When people meet you, uh, 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 when people meet you, Mark Brown, they meet you where you are. <laughs> and they can't appreciate where you are because they don't appreciate where you've been, Daphne. See, you met me when I'm on my phone, I'm flying on the stage, all polished. But you should have met the guy that was crawling out of a hole somewhere. You should have met the girl that was coming off the club just getting fresh off of a stripper pole. You should have met that girl. But see, you all fascinated with who I am. But you have to understand where I've come from to appreciate how far I am. Well, you ain't all that, Pastor. That's true. I'm not all that. But you should have saw how far I came from. Oh, no, I got a long way to go, Sharita, but you should see where I came from. So when I praise God, I'm not praising God just for where I am. I'm praising God for how far I've come. Somebody give God 30 seconds of praise. If you just appreciate where he's brought you from, you're not going to talk to me in here. You're not going to, you complaining about what you don't have and what you need. But God said, give me a praise for what I've already done. If I don't do nothing else, I'm going to praise him for what he's already done. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, I don't mean to get on your nerves, but this praise right here is for what God has already done. If he don't do nothing else, I got to take a moment right here and thank him for what he's already done. Come on and give God praise for what he's already. You ain't going to praise him. You ain't going to praise him. You ain't going to praise him. See, the problem many of you is you always come to God with your hand out asking God to give you more. But you ain't praising for what he's already done. And God said, you owe me a praise before you ask me for anything else. Before you ask me for any other blessing. I just need you to thank me for what I already done. Now, come on, let's do it. He blessed you. He blessed you with your crazy self. He blessed you with your retarded self. He blessed you with your anxious self. He blessed you with your rebellious self. He blessed you with your hard-headed self. And he blessed you anyway. I wish you would sit there and act like God ain't been good to you. Somebody. Sit down, I'm not done. God gets the glory out of our weakness. Not out of our strength. God got the glory out of Samson's weakness. All he had was a jawbone. Not out of an army, not out of a sword, not out of a shield, but out of a jawbone. God gets no glory if you have everything going for you. 
People may laugh at what you got to work with, but I'm trying to tell you right now, if it works, keep working it. Don't let people laugh or keep you from doing what you do. Sometimes when you do something, it looks weird and quirky, but it works. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? God will give you a crazy idea, and it looks weird and it's quirky, but it's working for you. Don't let nobody talk you down whenever you're doing it's working for you. Let them laugh. It's working for me. Somebody said, well, tithing, that ain't biblical, but it's working for me. Come on. Somebody said that going to church for an hour doesn't work, but it's working for me. Oh, you wasting your time going to a church, sitting up under a man, listening to the word of God. You should be out partying. You should be out clubbing. You should be out whatever. They'll call you crazy. They'll call you radical. They'll say, don't take all that. But look at him and say, it's working for me, though. It's working for me. It, it, it helped me raise my kids. It helped me keep my family together. It helped me keep my sanity in my mind. It helped me grow a business. It helped me pull myself together. It helped me pull myself off of drugs. Come on, it's working for me. Look at somebody testify. It's working for me. This world sometimes try to intimidate you, and you let them. They push you in a corner. God ain't real, and church ain't real, and preachers ain't real, and it's fake, and it's nothing to it. But you got to get mad and push back and say, that's fine for you, but it's working for me. Ooh, yeah, look at somebody say, it's working for me. And if it's working for you, keep working it, baby. Keep working it. If prayer is working for you, keep on working it. If praising God is working for you, keep on working it. You can go somewhere else where they don't praise God. Where we're dignified and we keep it all together. That's fine. But we shout over here. We yell over here. We sweat over here. But it's working for us. <laughs> Look at somebody say, it's working for me. Number two, it was a poor weapon. It was unusual, but it was poor, too. Samson was facing an enemy with the latest weaponry using primitive tools. How unfair is that? How unfair? At the time, the Philistines had the latest tool. They had the sword, they had the spear, the spears, they had the chariots, they had the armor. What I thought was interesting about this was that God gave him a jawbone and didn't even give him any armor. He gave him an offensive tool, but no defensive tools. <laughs> he, he was severely severely outnumbered. And what he grabbed was a poor weapon. And you would think, I hear some of you saying right now, Lord, if I just had better, I would do more. If I just had better. If I, if I just had better staff, if I just had better equipment, if I just had better talent, if I just had better education, if I had a greater skill set, God, I would do more for you. I would accomplish more. But God anointed Samson to work with substandard equipment. And this is when you know you're anointed. When you can take something that shouldn't work and God blesses it to work. That's when you know you're anointed. When God can take something that normally wouldn't work, but it's working because you're anointed to do it. And listen, he didn't complain like we do. He didn't sit around and complain about what he was given. Let me say this to you. You will never get anywhere in life complaining or comparing. Y'all should have tweeted that. Y'all should have put that on Facebook somewhere. I don't know. Somebody's Instagram. You'll never get anywhere in life as long as you are complaining or comparing. I told you, comparison is the thief of joy. You don't appreciate what you have because you're comparing it with what somebody else has and you don't get joy out of what you do have. Good craftsmen don't waste time complaining about the tools they have. If you're a good craftsman, you'll just work with what you got. They don't start say, well, if I had me a smart tool, if I had me whatever, they take whatever they have and they work it. Who am I talking to? God's trying to tell somebody to take whatever you have and work it. Work it. Take whatever he's giving you and work it. You can't get nowhere complaining about what you wish you had. I wish I had. You got to take whatever God gave you and use it to your glory. Now, I know you don't do this today, but I came up in a time where we didn't have the fancy screwdriver. We take a butter knife. We didn't have no cable. We had the, uh, uh, the, the hanger on the back of the TV set. 
Come on, somebody. I'm talking about working with what you got. And we were sitting there watching the TV show just as good as somebody who was paying for cable because we knew how to work it. <laughs> Look at somebody say, you got to work it. You, you got to work it. It's poor. It's, it's, it's poor. It's mediocre. It's crazy. It's retarded. The antenna leaning to the side, but it's working. Oh. They make the best of it. Here's what Samson did. Instead of sitting up complaining, Lord, this is all you're going to give me? And that's how some of you are today. When God gives you something, you complain about, Lord, this is all you're going to give me? You're going to give me this little job. This, this little job. You're going to give me this minimum wage and make me work with it? You're going to give me this little house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're going to give me this, this little influence and make me work with it. Some of us are so spoiled, we don't know how to work with it. You keep saying, God, if you give me a 10,000 square foot mansion, I'll really deck it out. Woo, give me a 10,000 square foot, boy, I'm going to deck this house out. And God said, I'm going to give you 900 square feet and see what you do with it. And if you can't work with the little I give you. Wow, let me give you the word of God. He is faithful over a few things. I'll make him ruler over much. So sometimes God is testing you with the few things. And so if you can't keep a 900 square foot house clean, how God going to give you a 10,000 square foot house? You are showing him now what you will do when you get it. Y'all not going to talk back to me. Y'all not. So God gives you a little bit to test you and says, work with it, baby. Work with it. I'm going to give you the minimum wage, but work with it. You're not going to come in at the top of the company. I'm going to bring you on at the bottom of the company, and I want you to work it. Show up on time. Complete your task. Do what you're told to do. Somebody's going to pay attention. Then they're going to promote you, not to the top. I'm going to promote you to the next level. Somebody's getting ready to go to the next level. They, they see, see, people are always watching, and they're always paying attention, and they're watching what you do on this level, because what you do on this level is an indication of what they can expect from you on the next level. So what God is doing is giving you a little bit, and when he sees how you work a little bit, he trusts you with more. Y'all act like I'm talking to myself. Trust three people around you and say, work it. Work it. Work it, work it, work it, work it, work it. People kill me wanting to walk in the door at the top of the company, but you don't want to work where you are. The way we decide to promote you is watching what you do on a small level. If you can't handle it there, why would I put you up here? <laughs> Y'all mad at me? Look at somebody say, work it. Is it possible that God has already put in your hands the thing he's going to use to propel you to the next level? What you say, Joseph? Joseph said, I was thrown in a pit. <laughs> they lied on me. That's what Joseph said. I had a testimony come in my head right now. Joseph said, they lied on me. The woman lied, said I tried to sleep with her. They threw me in prison. Then I got in my prison, and I started working my gift. Joseph didn't wait till he got out of the pit to work his gift. While he was in prison, he was working his prophetic gift. If you got it, you just got it. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you finish. You got to work what you got where you are. Am I talking to anybody in here? After a while, God promoted him, the same person who was forgotten, who had been lied on, who had been forsaken, who was sitting in the prison. God promoted him to second in command, but he didn't wait till he got to be the prime minister. He was working his gift in a prison. Is there anybody in here who has enough faith to work your gift in a prison? I know you're more gifted than your manager is, but can you work as an employee for a little while? Until God work out the circumstances to put you in a position of authority. Can you work with the little apartment I gave you? Can you work with the little opportunity I gave you? This is why people don't get promoted. Because you're saying, I'm not going to go up front until it's a big stage. I'm going to wait until all the fancy people are calling me. Then I'm going to really sing for the Lord. But God said, you need to sing for the Lord when nobody's looking. In fact, you may not have a microphone at all. You might be in your shower at home just singing on back. Y'all don't do that, do you? Y'all don't do that, do you? 
Really gifted people don't need an audience. They be in the in the shower singing to the soap dish until the soap dish starts swinging. They be singing around the kitchen. They be singing while they ironing clothes because when you got it, you just got it. Come on, somebody. Real preachers don't need a stage to preach. They preach. Listen, I'm at the park every morning walking, just preaching to the birds and the squirrels and the creek and the trees. I'm talking to the trees, Dick Mark Brown, saying, tree, give your life to Jesus. If you give your life to Jesus. <laughs> yeah, the squirrels be running off. I'm saying, come back to Jesus. Come right now. <laughs> because you don't need a stage to do it. If you just got it, you just got it. And you got to be faithful what you're doing when you got it. Look at somebody. Be, say, be faithful over it. It's a poor weapon. Heaps upon heap is what he said. Heaps upon heap. Heaps upon heap, little bit by little bit, over here and over there. Some of you get discouraged because God's given you something to do, but it hasn't changed in a week. <laughs> but when you're in a fight, you got to be determined that it might be little bit by little bit. It might be a little while by a little while. It may be here a little and there a little. And some of you, you don't think it's God. If God don't bless you in a week, you're ready to quit the job. <laughs> God put you on the job, gave you a vision of being the vice president. And if it don't happen in 90 days, you're ready to quit. Well, Lord, you ain't even been there long enough to get benefits yet. Come on, somebody. You got to stick with a little while. You got to stick with it. Some people would join the church. You want to be great and grand when you walk in the door. And perhaps God has made you the help that we need. Come on, somebody. Perhaps it is on purpose that God put you in a place where your gift is needed. So that your gift can activate. And then he plants you there and says, stay there and be faithful. And I'll take what you got. And rather than you keep chasing a stage, I'll let you create a stage. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. You're trying to get on a label. Why don't you create a label? Y'all not, y'all, y'all ain't ready for this. You, you, maybe, maybe God is trying to force you to be entrepreneurial. If you become entrepreneurial, you can hand something off to your kids. I appreciate you going up the corporate ladder, but you can't hand that over to your kids. But maybe God has put an idea in you to make you an entrepreneur that though it seems stupid now, your kids could be eating from it a hundred years from now. Y'all not listening to me. Look, somebody say working. Killed a thousand men. Last thing I want to say was his only weapon. It was his only weapon. I'm talking to somebody here very emphatically because you feel outnumbered and you're feeling outgunned. That's how you feel. I'm up against so many things, Pastor. I'm really feeling outnumbered and outgunned. And sometimes you feel like God is all you have. I don't have support. I don't have friends. I don't have the education. I don't have the, I don't have the, the connections. And sometimes God allows that to happen to where you get to a place that God is all I have, but see, that's God is all you need. You don't have an arsenal of fancy weapons. Y'all remember uh, uh, 007, Adrian? Remember 007 or some of y'all more modern, John Wick? You know, and he got out to fight, and he had those suits on, fancy suit, and he, in that fancy suit, he had guns everywhere. He had guns in the back, and guns on the ankle, and guns up the sleeve, and you know, and then when he ran out of guns, he had knives in his belt. <laughs> and he had all this stuff, all this stuff, and he had all these stuff, all these guns because if he ran out of bullets over here, he'd pull out something else and start shooting. And if he ran out of bullets over there, he'd pull out something else and start, he pulled off his ankle and start shooting. Then if he ran out of bullets altogether, he'd start pulling out knives and start throwing them at you, just pulling them out from everywhere. And if he ran out of knives, he'd pull out a cell phone <laughs> and turn the cell phone into some kind of fancy gun. He had all those tools to go up against an enemy. But Samson only had one. He had no arsenal. He had no extra backup or support. One jawbone, a thousand enemies. One weapon, a thousand adversaries. 
one weapon, no extra weapon, no fresh weapons, no new weapons. And some of you need to understand, if God is all you have, good God, God is all you need. I may not have my friends. I may not have a network. I may not have a great net worth. I may not have the right family members in place. I may not have all the fancy things I need, but what I do have is my God. Is there anybody in here who can testify and say, at least I got God. Give God 30 seconds of praise if you're glad. At least I got God. Oh, we got to go. Look at how strategic God was. That Samson just happened to find a fresh jawbone. Hmm. So in my imagination, I'm thinking that at some point, something or somebody had killed this donkey. At some point, before he got there, it was killed. And the carcass was already laying there. And it just happened to be in the place that, that, that Samson was going to happen to be in. And it just happened to be the place that the enemy shouted against him. And he just happened to see a fresh jawbone. And so when I start thinking about it, I think nothing just happens. When I think about it, Mark, that means that God had already in his foresight set up a situation that he was waiting for you to come on. And at the right time, in the right place, you discovered what had already been there. Oh, God, I feel like I'm dropping bombs on somebody. God said, I already set up your deliverance before you got there. I had the answer before the question even came. I'd already set up the circumstances so that by the time you came along and you needed it, you could grab it. He didn't have to go get a jawbone. It was already in the spot. Look at somebody say, you're in the right spot. You're in the right spot. It's a strategic. God purposely set this up. God was already, God already knew that you was going to have a problem. God already knew you were going to encounter a thousand enemies. God already knew that that was going to be the place. And when you needed it, God said, I'm going to send the help just when you least expect it. Who am I talking to in here? I like this. I like this. The Bible said this. It said, with the jawbone of a donkey... I made a donkey out of them. <laughs> That's what the NIV translation. I'm serious. The NIV translation said, with the jawbone of a donkey. See, I got to keep it PG. I got to keep it PG because I don't want nobody to put this on the internet and say the pastor was cussing people out. But if you really read it right, he said, with the jawbone of an ass, I made a... Well... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With the jawbone of a donkey, the thing that thought it was going to make me look stupid, I made them look stupid. Y'all not talking to me. God said, there's some things out there that's designed to make you look stupid, but I'm going to make them look stupid. For every enemy that's trying to criticize you and put you down and make you look stupid and make you feel stupid, God said, I'm going to turn around and make them look stupid. Oh, you're not going to talk to me. For everybody that tried to get you fired, you're going to fool around and be their boss. You're not going to talk to me. For the man that said you never be nothing, you're going to fool around and be trying to help him out. Y'all not going to talk to me. For that kid that say, I don't need you, they got to turn around and say, baby, I need you bad. You try to make a donkey out of me, I'm going to make a donkey out of you. Somebody start doing this. What you doing? I'm pulling out my jawbone. I'm going to make a donkey out of something. I'm going to make something look stupid. I'm going to make somebody look great. Wind it up, 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 wind it up. You ain't winding it up. You ain't winding it up. You ain't winding it up. You're going to make something look stupid. You're going to make something look crazy. They said you wasn't going to make it, but they're going to be laughing, but they're going to be laughing. <laughs> In the middle of a fight, he made up a song. And maybe that's the answer to somebody's situation. In the middle of your problem, in the middle of your crisis, in the middle of your dilemma, can you make up a song and make it be prophetic and start singing the song of the Lord even in the midst of what you're going through? Is there anybody in here that can give God a praise? It ain't worked out yet. It ain't done yet. I ain't won yet. 
but I'm going to start singing the song of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. While I'm swinging, I'm singing. While I'm singing, I'm dancing. While I'm swinging, I'm praising God. While I'm swinging, I'm shouting. While I'm swinging, I'm leaping. Somebody. Let me clear this up for somebody. Please understand that when you see me shouting, I'm not shouting because I don't have no problems. I've just learned, Mark Brown, that you got to praise him until you get a breakthrough. You're going to wait until the battle is over, and then you're going to shout. But I wish I had somebody who would shout now. Don't wait till it's over. How many of you got some stuff against you right now? I got some enemies. I got some critics. I got some cons. I got some folk that's betting on me to fail. But God said me, tell somebody that what I want you to do is to praise me while they're looking. To praise me while they're looking at you. To praise me while they're criticizing you. I dare you to give God a praise right in the face of your enemies. While I'm tearing it down, I'm giving God a shout. Take 30 seconds right here. Y'all ain't doing it. I'm trying to give y'all the secret to getting the victory. You keep saying, I'm going to shout when it's over. When I get the kids raised, then I'm going to shout. When we work out the marital challenges, then I'm going to shout. When we get the money, then I'm going to shout. But God said, you got to shout while you're putting in the application. You got to fight and shout, and shout, and fight, and fight, and shout, and fight, and shout, and fight, and shout, and fight, and shout. You got to fight and shout. You got to fight and shout. You got to fight and shout. You got to fight. And shout! Come on, somebody! You gotta fight! And shout! 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 Come on, somebody! Yeah! 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 Tell them! Tell him! Tell him! Tell him! Tell him! Tell him! Tell him! Come on, somebody! Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Tell somebody. Come on, somebody. I know. I know we look all crazy and it don't make no sense. But you don't understand that when we pat, when we jump on our feet, when we clap our hands, it's a war cry. I'm letting that devil know. I'm putting him on notice that I'm going to fight you and I'm still going to praise God at the same time. Somebody. You got to fight and shout. You got to fight.
somebody's going through something right now, I dare to jump up on your feet and give God a shout right here and let that devil know I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify. Oh, magnify. The Lord with me. Let us exalt his name. Together. It's little, but it's bad. It's little, but it's powerful. It's little, but it works. Come on, magnify him. Make God bigger in this place. Make God bigger than your worry. Make God bigger than your fear. Make God bigger than your enemies. Make God bigger than your problems. Magnify with me. Magnify with me. Magnify with me. Magnify with me. Clap your hands and give God praise all over this building. Lift your hands and give him glory all over this building. Come on, come on, come on, right here. For anybody who's up against something, you feel outnumbered and outgunned, you feel like everything's against you, I dare you lift your hands right here. Serve notice on that devil. I'm going to praise him anyway. I'm going to praise him anyway. I got a thousand problems, but I'm going to praise him anyway. I got a thousand issues up against me, but I'm going to praise him anyway. I'm going to keep on praising him. There goes problem number 75 down to the ground. There goes problem number 50. The number is coming down. Here comes problem number 25 falling at my feet. The numbers are coming down. You don't understand that while you're praising God, the numbers are coming down. The numbers are coming down. The enemies are not increasing. They're decreasing. The more you praise in God, the more your enemies are decreasing. Oh my God, the more you're magnifying God, the more small, the small your problems are getting. They're decreasing. The numbers are coming down. The numbers are coming down. And there are some of you in here, you've got numerous problems. You've got numerous issues. Yeah. Seems like every time you turn around, there's something going on. Yeah. Something with the money and something with the kids and yeah. something with the spouse and something on the job. And I, I thought I was okay. And then this broke out over here. But God said to tell you that the numbers are coming down. The more you're praising God, the issues are coming down. You had a million things against you, but they're coming down right now. The secret was in your praise. The first thing church folk want to do when they have problems is stop running the church. They leave church. And I don't know why they leave church, because you're leaving church to go back into a greater problem. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. But the answer is in the church. The more you come, the more you serve, the more you worship, the more you study, the problems begin to be smaller because your God is bigger. This is what, oh, God, I got to get out of here. This is what Samson did, Daphne. When he looked around and he saw there was no more enemies. When he looked around, there was nobody else to fight. Then the Bible said he threw down the jawbone because he didn't need it anymore. He, he threw the jawbone down, which says to me that trouble don't last always. Hallelujah. Trouble don't last forever. There does come a day when kids finally grow up and become adults. Trouble don't last always. There does come a day when God positioned you in a place of financial security and you're not trying to live from paycheck to paycheck. There does come a day when you meet somebody that really loves you and not just trying to use you. Come on, somebody. There does come a day. Trouble don't last always. Don't last forever. When he got done, Daphne, he threw the jawbone down and he gave it a name. He gave it a Hebrew name that means jawbone, which means this was my testimony. 
For some of you, you're going to walk out of here with more than just scars. You're going to walk out with a testimony. This was the place. <laughs> This was the place I was trying to get a job and no door would open and God opened. I kept on fighting and I kept on putting applications and I kept on knocking and I kept on asking. And this was the place that God opened the door. Who are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying for those of you who are up against something now and it may not seem like it's working for you, I come to tell you it is working for you. Keep on swinging it. Keep on praising him. Keep on coming to church. Don't be like these foolish people say, oh, church don't work. You left before the miracle happened. Stay there. Keep swinging. And after a while, you're going to win this. And you're going to be a testimony. He named the place the place of the jawbone. That means for everybody coming after me, I'm going to say, come here, Daphne. Let me show you where my fight was. Th this right here was where I didn't think my marriage was going to make it. Y'all ain't y'all y'all don't want to testify. This right here is when I didn't think my kid would ever get their stuff together. I'm getting them out of jail and I'm having to pull them out of situations and they act like they lost their mind. And I thought I wasn't going to make it. But look here. I need some people who have been there and done that to testify and say, I've been there, baby. Is there anybody can testify here that God, God, that, that if God has brought you out of anything, would you just give God a praise? You ain't got time to testify. You ain't got time to testify. We ain't got time for old-fashioned testimony service. But can you just praise God right here if God has brought you out of anything? So I come to tell somebody, look, get a, get a grip on it. Get a grip on your mouth. You're talking against your own deliverance. Get a grip on your attitude. It stinks. I can smell it from here. Get a grip on that negative mentality. Get a, get, a, get a grip on it. And don't you dare stop swinging until every foe is vanquished. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare quit. Keep right swinging. I know your family's saying it's crazy. I know your friends are saying it's crazy. I know your friends are saying, look at, look at that little church over there. Over there clapping in Goodlessville. But well, we're going to keep on swinging. You hear me, Mark? We're going to keep on swinging. Folk may come and folk may go. When you get back, I'll still be swinging. Because I'm going to keep on swinging until it turns into the thing that God put in my spirit. Y'all not hearing me up in here. You got to keep on swinging until the thing standing in front of you looks like what God showed you. If it don't look like what God showed you, that means it ain't time to quit yet. It ain't time to quit yet. If it doesn't look like what God showed you in your spirit, it's just a sign to keep on swinging. Woo! I wish I had time. I got to go. You don't know, shut that up. Hallelujah. Lift your hands right here. Lift your hands right here. Oh, about our shot. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. Hallelujah. I feel strength coming into this place right now for somebody who's about to give up. Who's about to give up? Who's about to walk away? God said, Don't quit yet. Don't quit yet. To be quite honest, some of you, God didn't tell you to quit. You just walked away. You weren't done with your assignment. You weren't done with your assignment. You just quit. Pastor, God called me over here, and I'm on assignment. And then you left two weeks later. You wasn't finished with your assignment. You just quit. But I want to inspire you right now. Whatever you're up against, you started a business, and you're ready to walk away because it don't look like it's supposed to. God said, don't quit. Keep on swinging that thing. The numbers are coming down. The customers are coming in. The support is coming. The help is coming. The volunteers are coming. The money is coming. You don't hear me up in here. Who am I talking to? Sometimes it's not going to be the people that you thought it was going to come from. It's going to come from people you haven't met yet. But you'll never see it if you quit. Lift your hands right here. Father, I pray for every person in the sound of my voice. 
who feels their grip slipping. Who feels their grip slipping. Their grip is slipping. They, they've been trying to hold on, but my, my grip is slipping. My, my hands are getting weak. My faith is getting weak. My hands are getting tired. My arms are getting feeble. I, I'm about ready to walk out on all of it. I'm about ready to say, forget it. I'm about ready to say it doesn't work. And God sent me this morning just to strengthen your grip right now. Lift your hands right here. God said, if you worship me right here, I'll strengthen your grip right now. I'll breathe fresh life into your spirit. I'll breathe fresh life into your mind. Creative ideas are coming to you. Creative concepts are coming to you. He told up, oh, say, help is coming to you right now. Fresh anointing is coming to you right now. The enemy attacking you is not a sign that you did something wrong, God says. It's a sign you're doing something right. He told up, oh, shot. The problem is going to make you stronger. You're going to strengthen your muscles. I'm putting you in the gym. I'm going to make you better than you were. I'm going to make you more prayerful. I'm going to make you more powerful. Oh, my God. I feel strength coming to somebody right now. Strength coming to you right now. Strength coming to you right now. Do this for me. Would you just put your hand on somebody's shoulder? Put your hand on somebody's shoulder right now. And I want you to press on it and speak the word. The Lord is strengthening you right now. I prophesy to you. The word is, the Lord is coming to you right now. The hand of the Lord is upon you right now. He's strengthening your spirit. Mama, I got that baby. Don't you worry. I got her. I got him. I got my hand on him. Everything you put in him, everything you put in her, God said, I'm going to pull it out of her. I got her. I got I got them in the palm of my hand. They're not going to get away from me. I'm too tough and I'm too strong and I'm too powerful and I'm too almighty to let that situation go down. This is the Lord's church. This is not our church. This is the Lord's church. It's in God's hands. Come on. Let the Lord use you. Let the Lord use you. Press on that shoulder right there. Press on it right there. The hand of the Lord be upon you right now. Hallelujah. Strengthen her right now. They about Osha. Feeble knees. Strengthen those feeble knees. Strengthen that back right now. Courage her right now. I know it's been a long fight. I've been trying and trying and trying and trying and nothing's happening. But God said it's about to change. 